have worship. Perhaps not all of them participated in that idol worship. But God was going to destroy the entire generation that came out of Egypt and he was going to raise a generation from Moses. Uh, sorry, from, yeah, from Moses. And I was thinking, if it were Moses that was down and Aaron was up, and God offered him that he was going to do that, think about it. There is every likelihood that Aaron would have accepted. That, that was a thought that just crossed my mind. And it's scary. It's scary. And we'll come to that uh, in a moment uh, to look at uh, this very particular passage. I think I left my clicker. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick, for putting that up there. Uh, joining to true worship. Joining to true, joining with God to true worship. This is the fourth Sunday in this uh, short series that we are looking at joining with God. And today, I'm going to try to attempt to answer this question. Why did God deliver Israel from Egypt? And I want to present to you two reasons. The first reason being the fact that in the scripture, we read that God intended to take the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land where he has already made a covenant with the patriarchs. We find this in Exodus chapter 3 from verse 7 to 10 where it says, The Lord said to Moses in the burning bush when he got his attention, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their crying. Uh, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of, the land, of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So, the first reason is to bring Israel in fulfillment of his promise, God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring this nation of his that has multiplied up to about 2 million people from those 70 people who moved to Egypt. But God was also going to bring out the Israelites so that they will worship him. So those are the two reasons. The ultimate reason, the end goal of bringing them out is to fulfill his promise by taking them to the promised land, the land of Canaan. But before they get into that land and live there as the people of Yahweh, God was going to bring them to Mount Sinai so that they can worship God there. Now, remember that these are people who have been slaves all their time, all their lives. They've not worshipped Yahweh in Egypt because they couldn't have the freedom to do that. They have been slaves under heavy yoke and heavy burdens. They couldn't have the life of their own. So, when God told Moses that, Moses responded to this by saying, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, when Moses asked that question, you know that at the back of his mind, Moses was someone who has flew, I mean, who flew out of Egypt because he attempted to rescue the Israelites. At one point, even though he, he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, 
he identified himself with his fellow Hebrews. And one time he was maybe just making his, his trip around and he saw an Egyptian molesting his fellow Hebrew and he couldn't withstand it. He came to the rescue of his fellow Israelites and killed the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. And one other time, he saw his fellow Israelites quarreling, two of them quarreling, and Moses stepped up and said, why are you doing this? And perhaps one of them said, who has made you ruler over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian the other day? And Moses realized his own people were going to expose him, and he ran away. So now God is asking him to go back to the same Pharaoh that he has run away from. And God said to him, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I am with you. So, Nick, do you want to do it by yourself? Uh, yeah, please, help me. No, I will not try again. Help me out there. Um, if you can continue rolling them, just follow me and roll so that we don't get distracted. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. That is where Moses was in the burning bush. He said, a sign that I'm giving to you is that when you bring them out of Egypt, you will, they will worship me here. You will worship God on this mountain. Moses then said, huh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. God is giving Moses a sign, and it is Moses who know that this is what God wanted to see from his people, that when they come out of Egypt, they will worship God on Mount Sinai. Now, the word that is used, worship, there, is actually a Hebrew word that is also translated sometimes to mean serve. So other versions that you have, if you read that verse, you will see other versions said, and they will serve me on this mountain. It goes, it's from the same Hebrew word that the English version translates either worship or serve. But what is worship? Well, if the Hebrew word avad is the word that means service and worship at the same time, then what that implies is that Yahweh is saying, I am bringing the Israelites out from worshiping Pharaoh, from serving Pharaoh, from being servants to Pharaoh, from being worshipers of Pharaoh, to my own people who will worship me. And think about that for a moment. Their service of Pharaoh was under a heavy yoke. Yahweh is bringing them to this mountain to worship him and to serve him, not as they served Pharaoh in Egypt. So, worship is actually that act of service that we render to God. It could also mean, worship could also include sacrifice. Because in Exodus chapter 4, verse 18, again, which is still the commissioning of Moses, he talks about when they come to this mountain, they will offer sacrifices to me. And when Moses went, to Egypt and gather the elders of the people and share this very particular message that he carries with him, 
who were told and the people bow down and worship. The people bow down and worship. So, God delivered the people of Israel out of Egypt. We've seen that for the past three Sundays that we've uh, handled this whole issue of the Exodus. Last Sunday, we looked at their journey from the Red Sea as they go through in order to come to this mountain to worship God. But last Sunday, what we paid attention and focused on was the fact that God tested them that they traveled from the Red Sea to Mara for three days and there was no water that was found in the wilderness. And when they got to Mara, they couldn't drink the water. So the whole essence of last Sunday was the grumbling attitude of the Israelites that we saw. They complained, they grumbled, they kicked, they resisted. And I suspected that a journey that was supposed to be a three-day journey took them two months. Because today, as they arrived on Mount Sinai, it said it was the first day of the third month after they left Egypt. Now, here's what is possible. Grumbling is actually that resistant. And I was thinking about how do you illustrate that very well. And I, for those of you who ride horses or, or donkeys, if, if the horse is not willing to go, it stays there and continues to kick, right? Grumbling can be that attitude that instead of making you go forward, it retards you and holds you back. And they were held back for two months in the wilderness, a journey according to what Moses said to Pharaoh. Three days journey. We will take a three days journey to go offer sacrifices to our God in the wilderness. It took them three months. But here we are today on Mount Sinai. So we left Egypt. We came to the Red Sea and we were struggling. How do we cross the Red Sea? And Yahweh provided a pathway on the Red Sea and we crossed. When we crossed the Red Sea and stood on the other side, and as we saw the Egyptian army drown, we sang praises to Yahweh and said, oh, the other nations that were going to pass through them, they will hear about what Yahweh has done for us. And they will be in trembling and fear. They will be possessed with trembling and fear and all of that. And then as they move Today we find ourselves on Mount Sinai and God is welcoming his people on Mount I was wondering what would have been in the mind of God. On that first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Here is the message, clear message. If you will obey me, fully obey me, you yourselves, I mean, actually he said, you yourself have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Moses came and declare this message to the people. This is the message Yahweh has brought to you. In fact, Moses climbed the mountain. I have been to Mount Sinai. I have traveled to Egypt, uh, uh, to Israel. In two, I traveled to Israel in 2008, and we had the opportunity of going to Mount Sinai. It's actually a range of mountains upon mountains upon mountains, and then you have to climb, I think, for about three hours. You have to go in the morning, very maybe around... 2 a.m., you will, you will be given flashlights, and then you will climb. Because if you climb when it's daybreak, you can't make it. You can't make it because of the heat. It's actually easier when the sun has come up and you are coming down than actually hiking the mountain to the top where supposedly Moses would have met with God and received the commandments there. 
So if it is a three hours journey, you think about it, as we're going to see this morning, you will see Moses going back and forth, climbing and coming down, climbing and coming down, going to meet God, coming to talk to the people. He will receive a message from God and then he'll come back and deliver to the people. And when the people responded, even in this message, Moses went back. He took the responses of the people back to God and said, Israel has accepted because they actually said so. They say, we will do. We will do what God has said. Well, Moses was actually performing the function of both the leader, the prophet, and the priest. Because the priest, the duty of a priest is to represent the people of God before God and to represent God before the people. He is like an intermediary who goes back and forth. He takes the request of the people and takes it to God and takes the answer from God and brings it to the people. That is what we see Moses playing here, the role that God has assigned for him here. The priest also instructs the people. He is a custodian of knowledge and he is the one that gives instruction about the law to the people. So the question that I will ask here is, why will God, why will he uh, take, okay, I have the question here. Why will God do that? He takes the people of Israel to give them the land of the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and all of those seven tribes that are mentioned there. Why will he do that? There are a lot of Bible scholars, Bible scholars, theologians, um, who study the Bible, who really criticize and say, why will God do that? Why will he take the land that belongs to other people and give it to the people of Israel? Well, is it because Israel was a special people? What do you think? What do you think? Let me hear your responses. Why do you think God would take the land of other people and give them to Israel? Why? Let me hear your responses. Speak. Because he wanted to. He had the power. He wanted to do that. Yes? Well, he was already promised them. Yeah, so the question is, why did he promise the land of others to them? That's the problem. Yes? Yeah, he promised it to Abraham. Well, well, why? Why Abraham? Because this is a land that belongs to other people. I think it might go even beyond that. This whole thing, I think, was, it goes all the way to Jesus. There's, there's, a, there's a witness, there's a testimony. Yeah. Yeah, but then the question is still coming back to the question here. Why will God, why will God take, because that is the question that some theologians are wondering and bothering and saying, this is not right. Well, here is, I suppose, an answer from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Listen to what it says, verse 6 to 9. For you are a people. This is Moses actually recalling this whole episode and this whole journey and this promise of the promised land to them. Listen to what he says. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. Think about that. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God 
is God. He is faithful, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. I think that the bottom line here is what we have just trying to tease out. It is out of his pleasure will. He is God. He is Yahweh to cry aloud. Now, if I have the privilege of sitting with such theologians and to dialogue with them and hear them say, that is not fair, why would God do that? Well, listen, what God was acting here, he was acting as the landlord. He is the landlord. He is the creator. He owns the universe. If a landlord, I, 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 am, I am a tenant, and God forbid that I misbehave, and uh, my landlord will give me a quick notice and give me two days to leave. God forbid that that happen. But does the landlord have right to do that? For those of you who are landlords, do you have right to do that to your tenant? Yes, you do. And probably you've done it. Now, God said to the Israelites, I am bringing you to this land that I have promised your ancestors out of my will, out of my pleasure. I, I'm bringing you here, but I'm bringing you to Sinai first and foremost to give you the codes of conduct, the law, how you are to conduct yourself in that land as my people. If you go and live the way they live, what will happen to you? You will leave that land. I will put you out. In fact, the scripture uses in Leviticus, it says, and the land will vomit you just as it vomited the other inhabitants. Now think about that. Did that happen to Israel? Yes. Is God fear to do that? Yes. Why? He is the landlord. He is the landlord. He owns us. We are his creation. And he did that. And so he brought these Israelites, these slaves. I strongly feel that, as we're going to see in a moment, that this Israel, in fact, someone said that God brought Israel out of Egypt, but Egypt never left Israel. They were struggling. Their psyche has been so corrupted. Their worldview has been, have been, have been shrunk into a slavery mentality. They couldn't just reconcile freedom and slavery. They were always drawn. They want to go back to Egypt. Always drawn. They want to go back to Egypt. Always drawn. They want to go back to Egypt. You think about it and you wonder, why will the people who did not have freedom will choose to draw themselves towards going to slavery and not freedom. God is pulling them this way to freedom. They are pulling them, themselves to slavery. Well, are we different? Are we different, brothers and sisters? Because, see, Egypt actually represents sin. And all of us seated here, We've been liberated from our former way of life. But how often that former way of life, like a magnet, drags us and draws us always, always. As the Spirit of God is pushing us towards transformation, towards becoming more and more like Christ, this sin, this, this, this old nature is drawing us back, is drawing us back. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, our natural default is to fall back this way and not this way. And that is what we see in the life of the Israelites. So the people accept the offer that Yahweh gives them. And even though they were not a very numerous people, Yahweh has promised he was going to give them this land. Well, when the people accepted the offer that God has given to them, we read in verse 10 of chapter 19 that God said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow, 
have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Consecrate the people. And the word consecrate there is set the people apart. Make them holy. And then God put limits to the children of Israel. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down to the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourself for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. And we're told that on the third day, in the morning, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain at a distance. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The, sp the smoke billowed up from smoke from a and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him from the mountain. See, this scenario, remember, as you read this scripture, uh, what the author is trying to do here is actually think about the encounter of Moses in this very particular mountain on the burning bush. Moses heard the voice of God. God calls him by his name and said, remove your shoes for the ground you are standing is holy ground. And that was when he commissioned Moses to go bring out the people. And he said, the, the sign that I am sending you to Pharaoh, when you bring them out, you will worship me on this mountain. This is exactly what is happening here. Except that it's not bush burning, but we see smoke coming out. And God speaks to the people. And Moses responds back to God as he speaks to the people. Now, this takes us to chapter 20, where we see what God actually said to the people. So turn with me to chapter 20 of Exodus and then see what the Bible says there. It says, and God said, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, <coughs> I am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor, if, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day, Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Five commandments that were given. The, five, the first five commandments are commandments that are pointing us towards God. 
There are commandments that point us towards God. You shall not make for yourself an image. Because in another scripture, I think in Deuteronomy, it says, when I appeared to you, you did not see any form. You didn't see form of an animal or a form of a bird or a form of a human being. Therefore, you cannot make any image to represent me, Yahweh. I am not represented by any image. You cannot do that. And you shall not bow down to such images anyway. And we're told, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has only come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourself that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your bond offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with a dress, I mean with dress stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, or you will expose yourself. Let me say something very quickly about that very particular instruction about if you build an altar with stones, don't use a stone that has been dressed with any tool. When Solomon ordered people to build a temple, we were told that all the stones that were used in building of the temple were dressed in the quarry. Why? Because there was no any noise of hammer in the building construction. This was a reference to that very particular command that the builders of the temple were honoring God. Stones that were rolled and brought, including the cornerstone, were all dressed in the quarry. They only brought them and assembled them in the temple site. So these people were completely, they received instruction. They heard God clearly. God spoke to them. They heard God speak. And Moses explained and expounded what God has spoken. That is what you'll find from Exodus chapter 21 down to Exodus chapter 31. And turn with me to Exodus chapter 30 where we just read. And then I will try to run up the sermon there. False worship of the golden calf. Remember, we're talking about true worship. What is true worship and what is false worship? Well, true worship is actually worship to Yahweh with other things involved, sacrifice, thanksgiving, praise, and all of that. False worship is false is worship that is offered to other gods, to idols. Well, Moses has gone back. I told you that there was a coming down and going up, a coming down and going up. Now that the people have accepted to be Yahweh's possession, they've accepted and they've heard God's instruction on how to worship. Now God calls Moses back to the mountain in order to give him the written codes. Moses was going to come down with the tablets that God has inscribed on them. These, these laws, these commandments, God inscribed them according to scripture with his own finger. He used his own hand. It's like the handwriting of God. He wrote these commandments and handed them over to Moses. Moses had been on the mountain for 40 nights and 40 days. I mean, 40 days, 40 nights, without water, without food. Now, 
when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. And as, as for this fellow Moses, they are no longer respecting him anymore. Who brought us out of Egypt? We don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then the Lord said, I mean, then they said, These are the gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So, that, uh, so the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down, eat and drink, and got up to indulge in reverie. In fact, other, scripture, other version says they got up to play. To play. Actually, the word used to play it's actually people who play under influence of drunkenness. It's a very bad word. But here we are. God, Yahweh, has just said in chapter 19, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. He repeated in chapter 20, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Here they are saying, it is this Moses who brought us out. It wasn't Moses that brought them out of Egypt. It was Yahweh. But see, because there is a depraved mind in play here, they are not able to articulate and reason wisely as to who brought them out of Egypt. In fact, Aaron is summoned by the people, come here and make us gods. Now, Make us gods? Do you, do, you, do you see the play of words here? Who makes who? Is it God that makes humans or humans that makes gods? Do you see the point? See, sometimes in worship and sometimes even as we believers, it is easy for us to handle a God that we can create. A God that we can create is easy to handle. A God that we create in our own minds is easy to handle. It was Jonathan Edwards who preached a sermon and a, a, a sinner in the hand of an angry God. And he said that, you know, people find it difficult to wrap their minds around the fact that God is eternal. God does not grow old. This God does not forget. This God remembers. See, we will want a God who grows old and gets out of memory when his memory begins to fail. I was driving with one uh, very wise elderly person, and he said, he was trying to tell me something. And he, he kind of forgot what he wanted to say, or he couldn't recall what he wanted to say. He was trying to calculate something, and then I heard him say, oh, this senior moment. Oh, this senior. And I said, what, what does that senior moment, what does that mean? I've never heard it before. So he repeated in that journey twice. And then something just said, oh, he's just telling about old age. If we have a God who can forget, oh, he's easy to handle, right? Very easy to handle. He forgot. But see, this God doesn't forget. He does not. He will bring back to justice the act of rebellion, the act of sinfulness that we do. This fellow Moses is no longer Moses. Who, it wasn't Moses in the first place who brought them out of Egypt. By the way, where did slaves get gold? How did they come about getting gold? Well, go back again and read the story. When God, God didn't even tell the, uh, Moses that, you know, one of the signs is when you are finally coming out of Egypt, you will plunder them of their resources. But he said, when you are finally leaving, 
let the Israelites go to Egypt, to the Egyptians, and demand. And demand. It's like, we've served you. Now it's time for us to go. We will not go empty-handed. They demanded. And that is where they got gold earrings. Slaves don't own gold or gold earrings. Here, in this case, they had earrings that was given to them by Yahweh. And how often do we pride ourselves? This is mine. This is my resources. And therefore, we, no one can take it out of me. It is mine. No. The Bible says whatever we have, it was given to us. And if it was given to us, why should we boast? Why should we boast? That is what scripture tells us. But Aaron, look at Aaron. Let me take a moment and talk about Aaron. It is a weak leader who the people will say, come here. Because the word command, come here, is not a good one. You are, you are talking to your leader, come here. Come and make us God. That is what they did. A weak leader will not tell them, this is against what we just received. No, 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 no. He said, bring gold rings. Bring them, bring them, bring them. And they brought them and he cast them into fire and he produced a golden calf and then presented to the people and the people started to dance around the golden calf and say, these are the gods who brought us out of Egypt. See, when people are debased in their minds, they do corruptible things that are very insane and you stand there and say, are these normal human beings? These are the gods who brought us out of Egypt. Well, Aaron did not only stop there. He went on and built an altar and offered sacrifices on that altar. What God has said they should not do is like you receive the instruction in one hand and violated it in the other hand. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Absolutely. So see, that is really the most amazing thing. That, that Lord there is in caps. That is Yahweh. That is Yahweh. Do you see the confusion there? You are right, John. Absolutely right. That is Yahweh right there. Tomorrow, there will be a festival unto the Lord. Some commentators have said at that point, Aaron realizes the foolishness he has demonstrated and he's trying to right his wrong. But that is wrong. It's like you want to, it's like David. It's like David. He sinned by sleeping with Uriah's wife, ordered Uriah to come home, and a foreigner who does not have the law said, how can I be in my home with my wife when my fellow soldiers are in the battlefield, I will not go home. And he stays there in the, in the palace. And this same man receives a letter from the king innocently and takes it to the commander. And the commander puts him in front of the battle because that is the instruction in the letter he carried. And he was killed in battle. A festival to the Lord, Aaron? Truly? Let me be honest with you, brothers and sisters. I have been wrapping, I'm trying to wrap my mind this week on this. And I said, is this, is this, is this normal? And let me be honest with you. I think I heard God clearly. You are not different. We are not different. We are not. We are rebellious. We are sinful, we are proud, we are obstinate. And sometimes we think about the pride we present ourselves. You ask yourself, so what are you proud of? What are you proud of? What do you have? What are you proud of, brother? What are you proud of, sister? Are you a child of God? Aaron, 
Aaron. Ah. I am made to conclude that if Aaron was the one who was on the mountain, when God said to Moses, go back, go down, go down. The people you brought, your people. Do you see how conversation turns? Your people have gone crazy. Go down. But before he said, go down, he said, leave me alone. Let my anger burn hot and I will kill them. And out of you, I will raise a generation. My brother, I, I am tempted to believe that if it was Aaron in the shoe of Moses, he would have submitted. He would have yielded. Because see, that is an attitude of a weak leader, of a bad leader, who does not know when to intercede and, 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 and mediate and, 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 and hold God and say, God, you can't do that. In fact, Moses interceded by saying, you cannot do that for your own name's sake, for your own glory, because the Egyptians will hear that you, the people you brought, you destroyed them in the wilderness, and they say, oh, that was the reason why you brought them out of Egypt, is to kill them. That was a heart of a leader. A heart of a leader who will intercede for his people, who will say, God, you cannot do that. Aaron would do that. In fact, read in, 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 in Numbers, in Numbers chapter uh, 10, uh, yeah, actually, Numbers chapter 10, um, there you will find Aaron and his sister, Miriam. They were actually mocking Moses because of the Hittite wife that he had, that Moses did not marry from the Israelites, and therefore Moses was almost like having an illegitimate wife. And you know what? God brought, he asked the three of them to come and stand before him. And in that instant, God demonstrated when I speak to prophets, I reveal myself to them in dreams and in visions. But when I speak to my servant Moses, I speak to him face to face as a friend with a friend. And who are you to challenge my servant Moses? And here's what happened. Instantly, Miriam was caught with leprosy. Instantly, she was caught with leprosy. Why was Miriam caught with leprosy and not Aaron? Why? Well, because Aaron is already on the pathway to be ordained to become the priest. So if the priest is caught with leprosy, then the whole assembly is screwed up. I'm telling you. Completely. Completely. God wouldn't do that. He spared Aaron from this very particular danger. So, what kind of a leader am I? What, what, kind, what kind of a leader am I in my home? What kind of a leader am I in the church? Am I a leader like Aaron? Do you know one thing? Go to Leviticus. You will read and you will see his sons, Nadab and Abihu. They had just been commissioned as priests to serve alongside their father. And they went into the temple and offered strange fire. I mean, into the tabernacle and offered strange fire. And they were dead instantly. Let me conclude this sermon by bringing us very quickly to the New Testament. And... The, the, the author of the book of Hebrews kind of tried to, to put this very particular experience of the New Testament and the, the New Testament believers and the Old Testament. So I titled that, Worship Then and Worship Now. Look at what it says. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, 
or to such a voice speaking with those who heard, it begged that no further words be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Even Moses, who was in the presence of God, because of the earthquake and the billows of smoke and all of that, Moses was trembling with fear. The author of Hebrews said, no, 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 no. That is not the kind of mountain that we've come to worship. We've come to Mount Zion. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. See to it that today as you hear the gospel, today is the day of salvation. Do not say till tomorrow because you do not own tomorrow. If they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who wants us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. That is the message that we find in the New Testament, that brothers, our gathering this morning as New Testament believers is not at Mount Sinai, it's at Mount Zion, the city of God, the new Jerusalem that he is bringing us in, that we are already there. The tension of this scripture is what theologians call the realized eschatology. Realized eschatology is that we are already in that Jerusalem worshiping right now, but we are not fully there yet. It's not yet realized. It's not yet realized. So that is who we are. And that is whom we've come to worship. You remember the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman said, well, we Samaritans, we worship at Mount Gerizim. But you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, no, 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 it's not about Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. A time is coming when true worshipers of God will worship me in truth and in spirit. Not in Jerusalem, not in Mount Gerizim. He said it is those kind of worshipers that God is looking. Worshipers who will worship him in truth and in spirit. Brothers and sisters, that is our position. That is who we are. That we worship God in truth and in spirit. We do not worship God in the flesh. We worship God in truth and in spirit. Let me conclude by reading Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Paul after giving the theological outlining of what Jesus has done and who we are, he then came with this appeal. Therefore, in the New Testament, and when you read scripture and in literature, when you say therefore, it's a conclusion trying to summarize what so theologically he has really dealt with issues very deep theological issues. In fact, he concluded with three chapters talking about Israel, the very people that we're talking about right now. But then he concluded by saying, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Our bodies. I've heard people say, oh, why? Why do you, why you in the church, why should you tell me what to do with my body? And I said to whoever that says that, I said, brother or sister, it is not your body. It was given to you. How did you get the body? You were formed in your mother's womb. How did you get there? You do not have a body that you can do whatever you want to do with it because it's your body. It's not your body. 
It's not yours. It's God's body. He gave you. Don't joke. It's God's body. Because God expects us to present these bodies out of ours as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's will is perfect. It's pleasing. In fact, Jeremiah captures it very well. He says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not evil, plan for a future and a destiny. God has a plan for us, brothers and sisters, and it is my prayer that as we present ourselves and as we come to worship, that we will understand that we've not come to Mount Sinai. It's not that the, the, the God of Mount Sinai is no longer the same God. It's the same God. It's the same God. We cannot get away when we worship carelessly. We cannot get away. And by the way, when we talk about worship, it's not just coming on Sunday. We've just spent almost less than two hours here, and I know some are already cringing. We've not spent up to two hours here. And right now, to the best of my knowledge as your pastor, I do not know of any other official time that this church gathers here apart from the band that comes to uh, practice on Wednesday. If we disappear now, we are disappeared completely. We cannot survive like that. We cannot. Brothers and sisters, we cannot survive. We cannot check in here on Sunday morning for two hours or less than two hours as if we have come to a coffee bar. No, we can't survive that way. If we come here, we are coming here to cap what we've been doing from Monday to Saturday. Six days. And I describe the way we treat God. It's like when we close this auditorium now, some of us behave as if we've locked, we've locked God here. And he's no longer in our homes. He's not in our offices. We don't represent him well in our offices, in our place of work, because we don't think that God is there. Why? We locked him up on Sunday. May God renew us a sense of true worship that in our homes, in our family altars, in our time of private prayer, that we reverence this God and honor him and we'll be a blessed people. We'll change societies. We'll change, we'll change Moses' leg. We'll, if we we will Moses' leg. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that we've not come to Mount Sinai, we've come to Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. Help us that we will be true worshipers that you are seeking for, that we will worship you in truth and in spirit. Please, Lord, may we not be careless in our homes, careless in our workplaces, careless in our schools, careless on the road, but the Lord we will truly say, we know who we are. We belong to God. And that we will care for this body that you've given us. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation that has given us this privilege to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen.